Okay, so this was uh, Perome, Frobenius, and related algebra. And this is going to be more about the algebra, eventual algebraic invariants for matrices, uh, in particular non-negative uh, matrices. Uh, I haven't uh, found time to type all of this stuff up uh, yet, but I, I will type up uh, some kind of a follow-up to this uh, to this lecture. So, um, uh, however, I'll have to be a bit. Uh, a bit telegraphic to get things in. Um, uh, there is some background on my homepage. Uh, so basic uh, symbolic dynamics and some of the topics of the course. Uh, symbolic dynamics uh, and matrices. That's something uh, short, which, uh, you know, you can read the basic definitions uh, of, about shifts of finite type and so on. And, um, and then there's also something about positive uh, K theory and uh, non-negative K theory. Those are, again, two short, pretty short uh, papers. Uh, First one's a semi-expository by me, and the second is a paper of myself and Jack uh, Jack Wagner. Okay, and then uh, so let's get started. Uh, so here's some basic definitions. I hope it's enough and uh, not too much. So um, let's uh, let's suppose that A and B are um, uh, square matrices over uh, a semi-ring uh, S. Uh, and S is always going to be a semi-ring which contains an additive and a multiplicative identity. And uh, you know, this, so you can think for example, um, uh, S could be Z, uh, the integers, the non-negative integers, the reals, non-negative reals. Uh, I'm also quite interested in the case that um, we have an integral group ring for uh, a finite group, especially, and then also the case where the presenting coefficients are, uh, are, are non-negative. Okay, and then uh, given that, we have a, a few definitions. Uh, well, first of all comes uh, uh, elementary strong shift equivalence. Okay, so I'll abbreviate this elementary strong shift equivalence uh, to be if you were if you went to a, a Jesuit high school. Um, anyway, uh, what does this mean? This 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 holds for these square matrices if there exists matrices U V over S, meaning with entries in S, such that uh, a is UV and B is VU. So something very, very simple looking. Um, it's not as simple as it looks. Um, this relation in general is not uh, a transitive relation. If we had matrices over the reals, for example, under this relation, the, uh, the maximum size of a nilpotent Jordan block could not change by more than one um, under this move, although it's not going to be uh, but then you could take, a, uh, you know, more moves and then change it by more. So uh, this is the elementary strong shift equivalence. And uh, well, so this is not in general an equivalence relation. And uh, the, equival the equivalence relation generated by this uh, elementary strong shift equivalence over S is called strong shift equivalence over S. So this is the transitive closure. If you can get from A to B in finitely many steps, each step being an elementary strong shift equivalence, then you have strong shift equivalence. Um, now, now comes one which should be uh, familiar to all of us. SIM stands for similarity. So this is if there exists U and V, uh, sorry, if there exists U in the general uh, linear group, uh, let's say, so of course in this case, these two matrices 
have the same size. And if there exists a U in the general linear group over S of this size, um, such that U, <laughs> U inverse AU is equal to V, then those two matrices are similar. Okay. So in the first two cases, I only had to have a semi-ring uh, here. Of course, I'm thinking about uh, S being a ring. Pardon? What should be? What should, uh, B. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. So uh, this um, one, two, three, okay. There we have three relations. Now there's going to be one more, which is uh, in some ways the most useful of the relations. Um, although at first it looks like the, the most complicated. I'm going to do a Polycott now. I always like to imitate my betters. Ooh, that's pretty low. Okay, I'll try to apply mag step. Um, okay, so one more definition. A is shift equivalent over S to B if there exists UV over S and uh, some L, a positive integer, such that um, A uh, uh, UV equals A to the L, V U is equal to B to the L, A U equals U B, and uh, B V equals uh, v A. Okay, so if you've never seen those equations, uh, well, it takes a little while to uh, become friends with them. They, they are quite uh, tractable in the end, and I'll come back to say some more about what these things, about what these equations mean. Uh, one thing to emphasize um, back here about the strong shift equivalents, those square matrices do not have to be the same size. So that relation is a priori in no way bounded. Um, in contrast to the, the similarity. Likewise, uh, here A and B uh, don't have to be uh, the same size. All right, now uh, what can we say right away? Uh, always, if we have um, A strong shift equivalent over S to B, that implies that A is shift equivalent over S to B. So we write a, a, a little commuting diagram involving the steps of the strong shift equivalents and looking at it for a moment we see that we can uh, you know, take an appropriate product of matrices that are involved and get the, get the shift equivalents. Um, so you can think of uh, also for S a ring if A and B are similar that implies that A and B are uh, strong shift equivalent and even shift equivalent. So you can think of strong shift equivalents and shift equivalents as being some kind of weakening of, um, of, the, of the similarity uh, relation. And uh, we'll see in a bit that this is, kind of an, this is quite analogous to passing from the uh, entire spectrum of a matrix to the non-zero spectrum. Okay. So um, the uh, the three uh, eventual um, algebraic invariants that uh, of a matrix A over um, uh, a ring S uh, that I want to consider uh, will be the following. Well, first, uh, the determinant of I minus TA. Okay, so we've already seen uh, what that means. 
That means non-zero spectrum of A. All right. Uh, a second one is the shift equivalence class over S of, of, a, of a matrix A. So what's the shift equivalence class? It's uh, you know, just a set of all the uh, matrices, which are also uh, shift equivalent. This is a, an equivalence relation on these. And then uh, finally, the strong shift equivalence class uh, over, over the ring. OK, so um, we know what the first one means. What the second two mean, uh, we'll see uh, coming up. And uh, um, let me uh, pull down. But what I'll say now is that uh, the uh, initial motivation and the continuing motiv a continuing motivation for looking at these comes from symbolic dynamics. But the, uh, I'll, I'll try to make some argument that these, these are natural algebraic relations as well. So uh, initial and continuing motivation Uh, symbolic dynamics um, but I argue uh, these are uh, natural algebraic uh, relations uh, also, all right. Now, let's uh, start with um, the motivation from symbolic dynamics, and this is a case where we're looking at the ring, which is just uh, the integers. And, um, you know, the, the square matrix uh, A over uh, Z plus uh, defines a uh, shift to finite type, which I'll write as sigma sub A. So this is some kind of a map from a, a space to itself. Uh, this XA is a sequence space. Um, um, X in XA is, is what? Well, it's a, it's a sequence. Okay, what kind of sequence? Well, again, I have to be telegraphic. Think about A as the adjacency matrix of a directed graph. Think about doubly infinite sequences of edges that you could see as the itinerary of an infinite walk through the graph. Okay? That's what these sequences are. They're just sequences of edges head to tail from the graph. And then the, uh, what is the, uh, the rule? Well, sigma A of x, that's the sequence whose um, uh, ith coordinate is just x sub i plus 1 uh, for all i. So all, all sigma A does is to take this sequence and then shift it uh, one unit uh, to the left. OK. So these. Uh, these are of some interest in dynamics. Every shift of finite type is topologically conjugate to a uh, shift of finite type, which is defined in this way. Uh, topological conjugacy is just the notion of isomorphism uh, for a dynamical system. If I have uh, two shifts of finite type, what does it mean for them to be isomorphic or topologically conjugate? Well, we have, uh, of course, we have their individual spaces. And the maps given by the shift on those spaces. And the conjugacy just means that there's a homeomorphism, H, 
uh, from XA to XB, which makes the diagram commute. So in this category, we give new names to the points of A, and we discover that really when we were in A, we were just looking at the B system uh, using a different language. Okay, so, um, so for this example ring now, uh, and the setup, what, what can we say? Well, the two shifts, sigma A and sigma B, when are they topologically conjugate? These are important systems we'd like to understand a, a classification. And uh, in some sense, uh, Williams gave a classification uh, in 73. These two systems are isomorphic if and only if the matrix A is strong shift equivalent over Z plus to the matrix B. Okay. Now, the, uh, the problem with this uh, is that, you know, 40 years later, we still have basically no general non-trivial class of matrices for which we know there even exists a decision procedure for uh, knowing whether or not the matrices are strong shift equivalent over Z plus. So this is kind of the fundamental open problem in uh, Z symbolic dynamics, which holds back a number of other uh, open problems. However, if we have that, we can do something which is easier. We can look at the fact that if we have strong shift equivalents over C plus, well, we certainly have strong shift equivalents over Z. Okay, so there's our eventual algebraic uh, invariant, and we'd like to know what that means. And in the particular case where we have uh, Z, uh, this imply this is the strong shift equivalence is not only implying shift equivalence, but uh, there's a converse. Okay, now shift equivalence is something which is much more tractable. It is a decidable relation. It's algebraic. You can you can do a lot with it. It's quite important for applications in uh, symbolic dynamics. Uh, Okay, so there's, there's one relation. Let's look at another one. Uh, this, this first dynamical relation was the isomorphism, the most fundamental. We could also look at the, uh, at the zeta function of the shift uh, sigma, sigma a. Of course, that's our zeta function that we were just looking at yesterday, our tan maser, or uh, if you prefer, Mullen Lanford. Um, and, uh, well, we already know what's going on here. You know, this is, uh, I'm not writing A and B, but, you know, a complete invariant here is simply the determinant of I minus uh, TA. A at this moment, remember, was a matrix over the non-negative integers. Okay, so we read off the reciprocals of the non-zero roots of A. We have this polynomial. That's telling us what the what the zeta function is, the zeta function is literally equal to the reciprocal of this, uh, this polynomial. All right, um, so there's one example um, of motivation, but uh, maybe this is not such great motivation for talking about a lot of different rings. You know, why not just stick with the integers? Well, uh, this is not the only symbolic dynamical uh, system which is classified by a strong shift equivalence of some matrix matrices. And so uh, there are several examples. I'll give just one more. Suppose we have um, uh, the case where the ring now is uh, the integral group ring, Cg, and G I'm interested in here being finite and also also abelian, so that I can talk about a determinant in a moment. Okay, uh, then uh, just as this matrix over Z plus gave us a graph, which gave us a, uh, a shift of finite type, um, a matrix uh, A over Z plus G, that will give us a graph which has, you know, labels on the edges from the group G, as we were looking at before. And that, that we can interpret as defining a, uh, um, a, a certain skew product uh, 
um, a, uh, a, G, uh, a G extension of the shift of finite type, um, a G extension, which I'll call SA, of the shift of finite type defined by A. Okay, so this is something else. Uh, well, I won't even uh, write down a definition. I'll put something in these notes that I've promised to type up. But uh, this is a pretty classical construction in, uh, in dynamics and ergodic theory. And um, you can consider what these things are up to the natural notion of isomorphism in this category. And Perry. Um, maybe in the 90s, Mark? You know when he did it? Sometime then. Anyway, it's, it's in a paper that I wrote with uh, Sullivan. He never published it uh, himself. And uh, uh, what he showed is that uh, this isomorphism holds if and only if A is strong shift equivalent over C plus G to B. Okay, so there's another example where we see, a, you know, a, a less pedestrian ring uh, showing up. And of course, well, we didn't understand uh, strong shift equivalence over Z plus. We certainly don't know what's going on here in a complete way. However, we do have at least an associated algebraic invariant strong shift equivalence over the ring. So we have another eventual invariant uh, showing up. Okay, uh, um, well, what is the meaning of uh, this relation shift equivalence over S? Um, uh, well, if, uh, if A is nilpotent, um, that implies that A is shift equivalent over S to the one by one matrix, which is zero. So that's, that's the spirit of this. You know, the nilpotent stuff is going to get wiped out. This isn't precisely true, but that's, that's the spirit of it uh, when we look at these uh, eventual invariants. Um, and um, if A, if, if we have a S a field and A not nilpotent, um, then, then we can actually understand quite well what this shift equivalence means. Um, well, in this case, we know that uh, A uh, is similar over S to a matrix, which has got a block form where uh, N is nilpotent, X is uh, non-singular. Okay. Now, uh, Maybe I should have uh, said back here with the nilpotent so why this is true. Suppose we have a matrix uh, V, which looks like this, and a matrix U, which looks like this. They're all zeros. If I take this product, I get a matrix with a lot of zeros. And uh, well, that could be the matrix A, which is uh, nilpotent. Okay, that's one of the equations of shift equivalence. On the other hand, if I look at UV, that's simply the one by one matrix zero. All the equations are satisfied. It's that easy. Okay. So now uh, for the similarity, well, we have this. And, uh, you know, a similar trick tells us that this last matrix is shift equivalent to simply the matrix S, X. Okay, so if we're looking at a field, then um, 
remembering that similarity implies shift equivalence, uh, we can say that A is a shift equivalent over S to B if and only if they're uh, non uh, nilpotent parts, these uh, matrices X, or if you wanted to think of linear transformations, the linear transformations to which they correspond, uh, these are similar. Okay, so you're looking at the eventual, the restriction of the matrix to the eventual image. That's the, that's the meaning of shift equivalence over, um, over the uh, field. Boy, I wish I could write as fast as Mark can. Okay, so uh, with that idea, let's uh, pause and think about, uh, let's, let's pause for uh, realization. Questions? Okay, so now uh, recall Uh, from the first lecture, recall the spectral conjecture. This was this conjecture of myself and David Handelman for uh, realization of a non-zero spectrum in uh, as realization of a non, uh, well, I guess I should say of a list of complex numbers as the non-zero spectrum of a primitive uh, matrix. Okay, so this is a kind of a converse at the level of the non-zero spectrum to the uh, theorem of Perron, which offered constraints on what the non-zero spectrum could be. There were three necessary conditions on this list of numbers for it to be a uh, non-zero spectrum of a primitive matrix over a ring S. Um, there were some non-negativity conditions on traces. Uh, there had to be a Perron value there, a positive number on the list bigger than the others to be the spectral radius. And then if you took the polynomial which had exactly its roots this list, well the coefficients of that polynomial certainly have to be in the ring S. Okay, so that was it. And then, uh, and we have in many cases uh, proofs that this is satisfied. In particular, Kim Orms and Rausch gave us, gave us the proof for the case of the integers, the, the most interesting and uh, probably the most difficult case. So in a sense, we, uh, we know for our eventual variance, you know, what can happen there? And that also tells us something in symbolic dynamics. It tells us what can be the zeta function of a, shift of of a mixing shift of finite type. Okay, well, um, now we can look at a generalized spectral conjecture. This is also myself and Handelman, about 20 years old now. And uh, the conjecture, not me. <laughs> um, and this, this conjecture is basically um, if uh, n by n, if a square matrix um, over S satisfies the necessary conditions of the spectral conjecture, then uh, there exists, so then it is uh, shift equivalent over S to a primitive matrix. 
Okay. So uh, actually, this is the, let me just give it a name, the weak generalized spectral conjecture. We generalized the generalized spectral conjecture, which was weak, to be stronger. Um, and you just change the statement by replacing shift equivalence with strong shift equivalence. OK. So uh, now, I, I, this may look a little bit abstract to begin with, but let's consider the case of the, uh, the case where s is just the real numbers. Okay? Then we're asking for a primitive matrix. Uh, what can be the non-zero part of the Jordan form? That's all, all we're asking. Instead of asking about the non-zero spectrum, what can be the linear transformation? Well, you know, apart from the emphasis on the eventual side of it, this is a question that matrix theorists have asked and gotten more or less nowhere on. And uh, uh, there are some results here, but uh, not so many. Um, anyway, this generalized spectral conjecture is the natural generalization of this classical problem uh, from uh, linear algebra to the uh, eventual viewpoint. Okay, so let's go back to let's go back to uh, shift equivalence over uh, over the matrix uh, over over the uh, the ring S. Um, so, for example, if we look at Uh, S equal Z, um, or any ring. Um, uh, now, uh, the relation of similarity over Z refines uh, the relation of similarity uh, over the reals. In general, there, there are some additional obstructions. Uh, and uh, we have that uh, the shift equivalence relation over z uh, lies uh, between uh, these two constraints. The, uh, the relation uh, um, of shift equivalence over z is uh, algebraic, quite interesting. Uh, it gets rather difficult, but it's understandable. You can work with it. And there's a complicated decision procedure due to Kim and Raj for determining whether or not two matrices are shift equivalent over the integers. All right, it's, it's kind of a, there's kind of an old classical, well, maybe 30 years or so result deciding when uh, two, two, two integer matrices are similar over the integers uh, by Grunewald, which has an appendix with about 27 number theoretic algorithms uh, cited. So uh, anyway, I could say some more. Uh, Give some more pleasant examples, but uh, I'll have to stop with this claim to uh, try to get to the end of the story. Okay, well, um, let's just see what the, what the general picture is. So for a general ring S, and, uh, you know, general means it has one. Every, every ring has one today. Um, what do we do? We form first the direct limit group um, well so this is given a square let's say a m by n over s so uh, you know we can multiply vectors by A, do it forever. There's a familiar construction, I hope, um, of the uh, direct limit group. Let's say I'm going to call it M A. Well, M doesn't sound, does not stand for group, so what does it stand, by, stand for? Uh, M A is naturally an S module. Sn is a free S module, and uh, the module action perseveres to the, uh, the direct limit. Um, a 
induces an S module, uh, not only a homomorphism, but an isomorphism. We call that A hat from MA to MA. Um, and, uh, and then finally, um, MA is a, uh, okay, S of T, this is just a set of polynomials with coefficients in S. It's a module over, over this ring with, uh, well, how does, how does this ring act? Well, the S part is already acting, so we just have to see how T acts. And uh, T, uh, well, I could have it act by A hat, but down the road, it's better if we have a T act by uh, the inverse of A hat. Okay. So the, uh, uh, for example, if we had a one by one matrix two, we were just looking at the integers, then, uh, well, the integers are a Z module, so we're just looking at a group. The uh, direct limit group will be isomorphic to the dyadic integers. This induced uh, isomorphism, A hat, would just be given by multiplication by two on the dyadic integers. If A were invertible, well, anyway, that was kind of quick, but it, I hope, gives a little flavor that, you know, you can compute plenty of examples and uh, it's not as bad as it might look if you've never seen this kind of thing before. Okay, so we've got this, uh, this module set up. Now, now for the, the hard one, what is the meaning of strong shift equivalence over S, where S, again, again is a ring. Well, uh, for the integers, well, you know, it was pretty good. Shift equivalence and strong shift equivalence were the same relation. So um, the first thing we might ask here is, is shift equivalence Applying strong shift equivalence over the ring S. And uh, well, uh, the answer was yes for S equal Z. It was Williams in the 70s, although uh, he didn't publish it until the 90s. Um, well, not much different really. If we take S a principal ideal domain, again the answer is yes. Um, this is Efros uh, in the 80s. Well, let's, let's keep going with yes. Uh, yes for S equal a Dedekin domain. And uh, this was myself and Handelman in the 90s. So if you think about the projective dimension, well, every 10 years we went up a step. That's not really very good. Uh, all right, and uh, that was it. And um, so uh, no other results since. And uh, what was embarrassing to me for 20 years was uh, no counterexamples either. Okay. So we, uh, but we can say now uh, quite a bit more about what's going on here. So I should probably Um, 
okay, so here's the theorem of uh, myself and uh, Scott Schmeeting, who I'm very lucky to have working with me as a graduate student. Um, so first of all, uh, what are we supposing? Suppose um, A is a square matrix uh, over S. Um, S is a ring, and uh, let's suppose B is shift equivalent over S to A. Okay, so we're, we're looking inside a certain shift, shift equivalence class. Um, we picked a representative out of it, A. Not really going to matter which representative we have, but we have to pick one. Um, okay, so the first thing is there exists a nilpotent We put this uh, where we'll be able to see it for a little longer. Okay, so one, there exists a nilpotent. Uh, matrix N uh, such that um, uh, B, this uh, matrix which was shift equivalent to A, is strong shift equivalent over the ring to the matrix A0, 0, 0N. Okay, so we have, we have some kind of uh, representatives. Um, of these. And then the second is that uh, the map, um, okay, so here's, here's a map. N is some finite matrix, no potent matrix, and uh, this is going to map to a, a matrix that looks like the following. It's got I minus Tn, now there's the variable, up in the left corner, and uh, it's got an identity down below. But this is a matrix which is infinite. Uh, that identity is an infinite matrix. Okay, so this is stabilized version of I minus Tn. And um, this map induces a bijection uh, from, uh, let, me, uh, let me see if I can write it like uh, phew. Okay, here we go. Uh, so we're going to look at the collection of strong shift equivalence classes of A matrix A0, 0n of this form. We know that every, for every matrix shift equivalent over S to A, we have um, a matrix uh, A0, 0n, which is strong shift equivalent to it. Okay, so we have all these strong shift equivalence classes. And now uh, this is going to uh, induce a bijection to what? Okay, this is NK1 of the ring S modulo a subgroup HA. So um, I have to tell you what these, what these letters mean. Um, and uh, w well, this is where uh, NK1 of S, this is not my terminology, it's algebraic K theory. This is the kernel of a certain map
and uh, it's the map which goes from K1 of the ring of polynomials with coefficients in S uh, to K1 of S. Uh, this is the homomorphism which is induced by the homomorphism of rings which is sending t to zero. Okay, so uh, uh, I, I'll define k1. So, and uh, well, k1 is not too bad. So, for a ring, for the moment I'll call it R since S is already working so hard. So, for a ring R, um, what is, uh, uh, we, we, I wanted to find what K1 is. Well, we have to start with the infinite general linear group uh, over R. Now, this again is not as bad as it looks. This is just a set of, you can visualize this as the set of matrices of the following form. Um, U is square, uh, you know, finite and invertible. Over R, so we just take a, a matrix which is in GLNR, stick it in the left corner. This whole thing is M by N, so this identity is the infinite identity. So this group is the direct limit of the uh, of the general linear groups of uh, all sizes. All right, so that's uh, that gets us started. Uh, that's GL. Now, and there's a very uh, important subgroup of uh, GL. So, there's the subgroup of elementary matrices, infinite elementary matrices. So this EL of R, this is equal to um, the uh, subgroup of uh, GLR uh, generated by basic elementary matrices um, what do these look like these are well let's say eij little s uh, so this is uh, a matrix where i is not equal to j this matrix is the identity in every entry except in the ij entry this matrix uh, is equal to S, and otherwise, it's the identity. So this is the kind of matrix such that if you have a, you're doing linear algebra, and you multiply uh, a matrix from the left by this, uh, you're going to have the effect of adding uh, S times, um, let's see, is it I or J? <laughs> um, rho I, S times rho I to rho J, or S times rho J to rho I write it out and check with. So this is the matrix which is accomplishing these, that kind of elementary uh, row operation under multiplication from the left. If you multiply from the right, you're accomplishing uh, this elementary column operation. Um, algebraic K-theory can be viewed as the, the theory of linear algebra over a general ring, and uh, things don't always go as smoothly over a general ring. And it uh, wasn't generated, uh, this wasn't Created arbitrarily, it's created for to solve problems in topology. Okay, but anyway, uh, there we have our elementary group, and actually, the uh, elementary group of R is the commutator subgroup of uh, GLR. Okay, this is the 
Whitehead lemma. And uh, so um, if we look at GLR mod the elementary matrices, uh, this is going to be an abelian group. This abelian group is the group which is K1, K1 of R. Okay, so uh, it, that has a you know a reasonably uh, direct uh, description, and these groups that uh, I described, the the K1, the NK1, the polynomial, these are important groups in algebraic K theory. So they're known. There's a lot that's not known about them, but there's a lot that is known about them. Thank God, as, as Mark said, you know, you want to know where to look. So we're, we're going to tap into all those smart people who've done the work in algebraic K theory. Okay, so uh, what can we say about um, the meaning of this uh, result? Uh, well, I guess before the meeting, I, I have to say a little bit about what HA is. Uh, I won't try to define it because we don't have time. It's something that comes out of the proof. It doesn't, it only depends on the shift equivalence class of A. Um, of course, it's a, it's a subgroup of, uh, of K1. Uh, however, HA is zero if uh, A is nilpotent. And HA, thank God, is zero if uh, S is commutative ring. Okay, so in those cases, uh, when we look at this, uh, where are we? There it is. <laughs> okay, We're, we at least don't have to worry about HA. In the most interesting case, the commutative case, we're looking at this NK1. So what's known about NK1? Um, well, NK1 of S is zero if uh, if S is what I'm told is uh, has the property which is considered you know the the mark of civilization in algebraic geometry, which is that S is uh, left regular Noetherian. Okay, so this, this left regular bit means that if you take a, a, a finitely generated projective module, it has a finite projective resolution. Okay, so Dedekind, you know, a principal ideal domain, we went up, Dedekind, we went another step. Okay, this just says, you know, whatever the length. So this gives us a lot more examples where, in particular, uh, uh, shift equivalence over S implies strong shift equivalence uh, over S. You know, for example, uh, rings of uh, polynomial, polynomials in several variables with, um, let's say, integer coefficients or rings in, uh, or, or Laurent polynomials in several variables with integer coefficients. Okay, but uh, um, NK1 is not always zero, as you can guess, since it has a name. Um, if we look at a if we look at if we look at uh, G just equal to Z mod NZ, then uh, NK1 of the integral group ring here is zero if and only if N is square free. Okay, so um, we get a lot of examples where it's, uh, it's not trivial. And um, then there's something that's uh, nice about this, this uh, situation. In general, if NK1 of a ring R is not trivial, okay, so it's an abelian group. If it's not trivial, then uh, this implies that NK1 of R is not finitely generated as a group. 
out of finitely generated uh, group. So this was Farrell, who I probably just misspelled. You know, until about five, five years ago, I had a, a special gift. I could spell anything, and now I, I just don't know. It will happen to you. <laughs> uh, so this was 1977, Farrell. And, uh, you know, when I look at this, I'm reminded of a nursery rhyme um, for you English speakers. Um, maybe it's Mother Goose. Um, you know, um, let's see, what was it? Something like, a, well, there was a little girl who had a little curl right in the middle of her forehead. When she was good, she was very, very good. But when she was bad, she was horrid. Okay. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, undoubtedly some of you are wondering why do we worry about such uh, abstract nonsense, and uh, I'll try to uh, argue that it, maybe it might be worth doing. So here's some applications, perhaps. Okay, so uh, one application is that the, the weak generalized spectral conjecture uh, implies the strong generalized spectral conjecture. You can have uh, subrings of the reals which have non-trivial NK1, but you can prove this. I can't, I can't uh, talk about... Uh, if you begin with that matrix A as a primitive matrix over S, you're in a position to work with this presentation and try to create a new matrix which is primitive and which is, uh, let's say, strong shift equivalence to a matrix of this type. And uh, that can be done. Um, uh, second, uh, a refutation of uh, working conjecture of of Bill Perry um, regarding uh, classification of uh, G skew products, what we're looking at in the second example. So here G is a finite skew products over, um, let's say, sigma A. Here uh, G is a finite abelian uh, group. Okay, so we, you know, we can say that some things we might know are true, might hope are true, in fact, are not. Uh, another thing I won't try to write down is that you learn something about what kind of proofs can work. Uh, there's there's a, a related paper in which um, Kim and Rausch and I give a proof, and we're just looking at matrices over the reals. None of this stuff, right? It's matrices over the reals. And um, well, anyway, at a, at a certain point in an argument, uh, we're using a we're looking at a subring of the reals. At a certain point, we're we're using a hypothesis that two matrices are strong shift equivalent over an underlying rank. We don't have a hypothesis that they're shift equivalent. We don't know how to prove it with that hypothesis. Okay, and uh, uh, you know, at the end of this uh, process, there's you know the some possibility of proving strong shift equivalence. Well, uh, so uh, our proof was not due to a failure of imagination. That wasn't just an artifact of the proof. There's really an obstruction. Okay, so it kind of helps focus your attention on uh, what you what you have to do if you're going to progress. Okay, so this is a lot of, uh, a little bit of abstract nonsense uh, pretty fast, but uh, let me uh, come down to earth again. Um, so all of this grows out of the uh, polynomial I see why there are lots of little bits of chalk. <laughs> These uh, polynomial matrix
uh, presentations uh, that we were talking about last time. We can use polynomial matrices to present non-polynomial matrices. And uh, let's, uh, as usual, you know, the fundamental case with regard to these matrices is the integers. And once you see how things work there, then you can do a lot of generalization. So there's a, there's kind of a little miracle that uh, takes place here, which makes everything work. And I'll try to uh, uh, explain what that, what that little miracle is. So, so this is, let me just say, the little miracle of uh, Kim, Rausch, and uh, Wagner. Okay, so let's uh, let's see it by an example. So, here's our here's a matrix A. Um, let's say that A is our polynomial matrix. It's got entries. It's two by two. The entries are t, t squared plus t cubed, showing a certain lack of imagination, t to the fourth, t to the fifth. Okay, so that's A. And um, well, for A we have uh, we have two labeled graphs that we can think of as coming from this matrix A. Well, for the first one, I'll just look at this two by two matrix. Uh, I'll use these powers of t as labels. So I'll have a, a label of a t for an edge from 1 to 1, t squared from 1 to 2, also t cubed, t to the fourth going back, uh, t to the fifth. OK, so that's, that's easy enough. Now, this was not the matrix we were using to present the non-polynomial matrix by way of this polynomial. There was also the graph with the adjacency matrix uh, I was calling A sharp, okay, which got us back to a, an honest shift of finite type. That looked much like the, the previous one, but we take the t's off, and where we have uh, an exponent bigger than one, we throw some vertices in, uh, in between. So we have, uh, in this case, it looks like one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four. Okay, so that's the uh, that's the other matrix. Now, uh, let's. Uh, Let's use this first matrix as an abbreviation for this matrix. Okay. So when I write that first matrix, uh, I'm using it as a shorthand uh, for this matrix. All right. Now, um, shorthand for this matrix, which is actually defining the shift of Finite type. And now, uh, what is a what is a point? A point uh, x. Well, in the shift of finite type, uh, remember what that is. X is a doubly infinite sequence. Uh, what does it looks like, uh, look like in terms of this graph? Uh, well, um, let's, uh, let's pick it up at some point and uh, let's just look at a sample. There's a t cubed from 1 to 2, t to the fifth from 2 to 2. Um, let's just stay with 2 for a moment. Uh, how about t to the fourth from two to one, you know, and so on. Okay, so, and uh, well, these, um, this t cubed, this, this, this is three edges, and this looks like some part of this point. So, um, 
uh, let's say, for example, I might have x minus 2, x minus 1, x0 is the three edges here. Okay, and then for the next five edges, it could be x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, uh, you know, and so on. Okay, so I'm, I'm just trying to make clear, I hope, what the shorthand is uh, for the point. All right, now, um, now let's do a little operation. Um, so, uh, this, this operation in general is going to involve uh, considering uh, vertices which are not different. And I'll just give an example. Uh, I think we agree that 1's not equal to 2. I just mean that I'm giving an example, not claiming a theorem. So, let's, uh, let's remove from our graph the uh, labeled edge, which is TQ. Okay, I'm going to remove this. Okay, now removing this, uh, well, I can also, th I can think of that as also removing this labeled edge and also, uh, uh, you know, any uh, pair which is, begins with this labeled edge and uh, is followed by something which can follow this uh, edge from uh, labeled t cubed. So what could follow it? The, the t to the fifth or the t to the fourth. So this also uh, removes um, these paths, uh, you know, these, these longer paths. Okay. Now, what we also do, in addition to removing, we, uh, we, we compensate and we, uh, we add in um, uh, some compensating paths. And what are these paths? Well, um, I'll add in a path from 1 to 1 labeled t to the 3 plus 4, t to the 7 if you like. Um, so that's, of course, uh, kind of making up for this one. And also, we'll add in a path from 1 to 2, labeled t to the 3 plus 5. That's compensating for the loss of this, uh, of this other path. Um, now, this gives us a, a new matrix. Okay, so this gives a matrix B, and what is this matrix? Well, let's look at A. Uh, so I uh, leave a little room. I'm going to copy all of A, except for a T cube, which is gone. And then I'm going to add in the, uh, let's see, which row? One, the first row. I'm going to add... Uh, t to the 3 plus 4. There's a vertical column just for visual separation. And here I add t to the 3 plus 5. Okay, so that corresponds to adding in those, uh, those transitions. So I have a new polynomial matrix. Okay, now, okay, so the first thing is this new polynomial matrix defines a shift to finite type which is topologically conjugate to the one defined by A. Okay. Why is that? Well, uh, this is in, let's say, XA, the A shift. Uh, there's something that corresponds to it in the B shift. Uh, what's it going to be? Well, there's T cubed. Okay. Uh, that's gone, but I look at what comes next, and uh, in the B system, I have this edge. So if I'm thinking of a map from the sequence space, which is the A shift to the B shift, well, wherever I see this 
T cubed, which corresponds to a certain set of edges, I look at what comes next, and that tells me how to map. Okay? And then down here, well, I look at, if I, I, if I have one of these uh, new, new symbols, I can go back. Both of these are continuous. They're both given by block codes, if you're familiar with that. Um, what about this next t to the fifth? Well, uh, this is not t cubed. I look back to the left. Uh, well, this was not t cubed. Okay, so this one just gets copied. Okay. Um, likewise, the t to the fourth just gets copied, and so on. Okay, so that, that's not really a miracle yet. Um, uh, what we have at the moment is just that uh, this was a kind of a little transformation which uh, gave us, uh, uh, let's say, that these two shifts of finite type are topologically conjugate. Okay, here comes the miracle. If we look at this, uh, the relationship of these two, um, these two uh, matrices, uh, A and B, we can uh, kind of reformulate things a little bit. Let's look at the matrix I minus A, which maybe should make you think of the determinant of I minus A. Anyway, I minus A, uh, that looks like 1 minus T minus T to the fourth. Uh, and then we have minus t squared minus t to the fifth. Uh, I get that? Oh, t cubed. T cubed. Okay, and we have one minus t to the fifth. Okay, that's that's a matrix i minus a. We have a matrix i minus b. Okay, that was one minus t minus t to the 3 plus 4, uh, underneath it, uh, minus t to the 4, uh, to the right, minus t squared, minus uh, t to the 3 plus 5, on the bottom, 1 minus t to the 5. Okay, so uh, how are these related? We get from one to the other by multiplying by an elementary matrix. Okay, this, this matrix has exactly the effect of producing this transformation. Okay, so um, that's the miracle. And that is the miracle which uh, gets, you, gets you moving into um, the algebraic K theory. I won't say too much more, but I have to say a little. Um, uh, so there's, there's this theorem. Um, so this is, you know, modulo a technical complication we don't want to discuss, which is not important, but it's technical. Um, this is a theorem of myself and Wagner, certainly known also to Kim and Rausch, um, that uh, for A and B over T, Z plus T, uh, they define conjugate shifts of finite type um, if and only if uh, I minus A, I minus B are uh, connected by finitely many moves. Um, uh, let's say of the type uh, E times I minus C equals I minus D or I minus 
C E equals I minus D. So this is where uh, E stands for an elementary matrix. Uh, I'd write it a little more carefully if we weren't, if we had more time. Um, the important thing here is to notice that Um, so I guess I will say where E is an elementary in the elementary group of uh, polynomials uh, over T and um, C D are over T Z plus T. Okay, so um, this is not the same as just saying that you can multiply I minus A on the left and right by elements of the elementary group and get I minus B. You have to proceed step by step through matrices which have this kind of legal positivity pattern. Okay. So what this is, this is, a, uh, this is another uh, classification scheme. Um, on the one hand, you have the shift equivalence, elementary strong shift equivalence. You have the elementary strong shift equivalence and shift equivalence. Here you have the same thing with these elementary matrices. Um, uh, I think you need them both. This, this setup is uh, it's a lot more functorial. Uh, I don't have really time to describe, and it also suggests uh, more, uh, more relations with um, algebraic K-theory ideas, which, uh, of which you've seen one example. Um, uh, there's some other things to say, but I shouldn't overstay my welcome uh, too much longer, um, <laughs> just a little. Uh, so one, uh, one aspect of this is that uh, by getting these uh, connections with the, uh, the um, algebraic K-theory, you start to see patterns which might be useful for actually helping us out with the original problem over z plus t, even though there's some abstraction here which doesn't seem to pertain. Uh, Wagner already was able to use uh, k2, uh, k-theory group k2 uh, of uh, the dual numbers, so-called dual numbers, anyway, a certain ring in order to give a proof for a counterexample to Williams' conjecture that um, Shift equivalence implies strong shift equivalence. So he probably an alternate proof. Uh, he has some kind of a, a vision of algebraic K-theory eventually coming in to do the whole thing. Um, uh, retired before he finished, but it's, it's not, a, not at all impossible that um, these ideas might, might help. So uh, now if you ask me, do you really think that they're going to help? <laughs> uh, well, uh, then I would just quote Sinai. So I was at a talk, and Sinai was giving his uh, presentation of, you know, results on the Merbius shift and uh, so on, and probability measures, and, uh, you know, and uh, he was asked, well, do you really think this is going to help you prove the Riemann hypothesis? Uh, and he said, the situation is not hopeless. <laughs>